usually encountered uh, some of the kids uh, presented uh, with a cross fight in early ages. So whether we should um, treat such cases or we should wait and which cases need to be treated, not we're going to discuss and what is a toolbox and how we can utilize that toolbox, okay? The two articles I have shared with you, they are very good. One is a nice case report, very clean case report, uh, how the early treatment give you such a positive result and how um, to correct the major problem into the uh, simple uh, malocclusion. And um, it is only, you can get such results uh, in class three management only when you selected the right case. If you're not selected a right case and you're given the face mask, you will not receive such results. So diagnosis is a key, uh, key which cases need to be treated and which need to be observed. Our focus is mainly, uh, mainly on the orthopedic appliances, but we're going to touch uh, class three as complete. What is a class three, how to diagnose it? And we also are going to deal with some of the non-orthopedic appliances, which could be used to correct the class three malocclusion in early age. So what is a class three malocclusion? Class three malocclusion is an occlusion in which the buccal groove of the mandibular first molar occludes mesial to the mesiobuccal cusp of the maxillary first molar. So there is in bottom line, if we see class three malocclusion, it could be a true class three malocclusion in which if you do the CEF, you will see there is A and B, which is negative. Okay, the width analysis show negative reading. And then there is a, a pseudo class three where there is an anterior cross bite, there is a dental component, but is having a functional class three, which we discussed in which there is a, a COCR discrepancy. So the midline is deviated while the patient open the jaw and it's straight, midline is straight when the patient is in CR, but then there is a cross bite, interior cross bite and shift of the mandible on closing the jaw. So the patient could present as the true class three or as a functional or pseudo class three. What are the incidents? Uh, it varies with the type of the population. So um, ethnic and location where the patient lives, there are two um, places where on the basis of this class three malocclusion would be uh, determined. Okay. So incidence is depend on uh, the location and the eth ethnicity of the um, patient. So in United States, the class three mal occlusion is less than 5%. In Koreans, it's four to 14%. In African-American, it's range 6.3%. In Latino American, the class three found is 9.1%. And in Mexican-American, 8.3%. So it's more in the Japanese and it is very prevalent in the African um, region, okay? In Asians, the class three, which is, it's not much common, but whichever the, if you find any Asian with a class three, they usually exhibit the mid facial deficiency. So such are easily, easy to be treated, okay? What are the causes of class three malocclusion is multifactorial. It could be the genetic uh, proposition, it runs in the family. It could be because of the habit or functional reasons, COCR discrepancy. It could be because of any childhood trauma uh, and deformities in the condylar region. And it could be because of the habit of mouth breathing and popping the lower jaw forward. There are several of the bones of the skull which is involved and participate in complex malocclusion, which is a cranial base, the nasomaxillary complex, and the ramus and corpus. So actually the whole skull actually contribute towards the creation of the class three malocclusion. How? So class three malocclusion usually encountered in the people with a small anterior cranial base. 
if you remember my previous lecture, we said that African usually have the point of mesion, it's inside. They have a short anterior cranial base. Whereas in Asian, the nasion is in the middle. And in European, the nasion is a little bit forward. Moving the nasion into uh, anterior position, showing that, uh, that there is a length of the anterior cranial base is more in the European as compared to in African. So when the length of the anterior cranial base is short, the point of the nasion is little bit behind and there is more chances of presentation as bimex protrusion or class three malocclusion. Okay. The second area which the bones uh, complex bone, which actually uh, presented present as class three malocclusion is a nasium maxillary complex. So hold the sutures and um, how the maxilla grow downward and forward. If in somehow it become trapped in the mandible and it's not able to move downward and forward, uh, because of any uh, growth abnormalities or because of any of the habits, these sutures can't able to move downward and forward. It presents as maxillary deficiency in the length of the uh, maxilla, so max length of the maxilla, vertical maxillary deficiency, and anterior posterior maxillary deficiency. Okay. The other component is ramus and the corpus of the mandible. There is more growth. So condyles are anteriorly positioned and there is more growth of the mandible which promote the class three malocclusion. So at the rule in class three malocclusion, if it's originate because of the mandibular prognathism, orthodontic treatment in the growing patient, like in early age is not a good choice. And in most cases, orthogenetic surgeries are recommended at the end of the growth. So such cases where you know that mandible is clear cut for, uh, it's, it's an issue. How we know about it? By the medical history. If the medical history say that in the family, the grandparents and the parents suffering from uh, increase in the mandibular length and they have that prominent chin, it means they, they are class three patients or they may undergo a maxillofacial surgery to correct the issue. It means they are class three due to increase in the mandibular size, okay? The other uh, thing is how we know that is a class three is by, by majoring in OPG, I have showed you that you see the distance between the crypts, okay? The tooth crypts, the permanent tooth crypts inside the OPG, you see the distance between them. If the crypts are widely spaced, it means in the mandible, and there is a crowding in the maxillary dentition, it means it's a class three because the mandible have high uh, growth potential, and it's class three because of the mandible, not because of maxilla. So by looking at the uh, OPG, by knowing the family history and any history of the surgery in the family, and by doing the CEF analysis, in CEF analysis, you see that there is A and B, which is quite severe, showing that it's a class three because of the mandible, and you can even measure the length of the mandible. We have seen that how to measure the length of the SN, anterior cranial base, and you measure the length of the mandible. And then the length of the anterior cranial base from nasion to cella, midpoint of the cella, is the length of the anterior crani cranial base. And, and the length of the mandible body, if it is, um, and the adult patient is 65 plus 5, okay? It's 65 plus 5. And then this length would increase 
uh, if it's not that norm and it's 65 is the length of the mandible, for instance, right? It could be any number. And then the length of the cella base. So you compare both length. So if you take the length of the anterior cranial base plus three for growing kids, plus seven for adult. So this is a norm. This should be the length of the mandible, plus three or plus seven. This should be the length of the mandible. If the length of the mandible is more than plus three of the anterior cranial base, it means that patient is suffering from increase in the mandibular length. In the growing patient or plus seven, so in the permanent. I hope it is clear, okay? So these are the couple of the ways you know that who is at the fault, uh, the maxilla or the mandible get the history of the patient, you see the OPG of the patient, okay? And then um, after looking at the history OPG, then you see even on the staff and you know that, okay, um, it's really a mandible is at fault or it's because of the maxilla. Because most of the time it's maxilla, right? But yeah. you know, the key is that early orthopedic treatment is not su successful if your patient is suffering from mandibular prognathism. So, okay. so whole key is that that face mask only work when uh, the maxilla is at fault. So initial okay. diagnosis, we need to know that, okay, we are going for the early treatment, which is our topic. So whether it's the patient I'm uh, taking and giving all these appliances will give me the benefit or not. Okay. Or I should okay. not do anything and leave it for the surgery. So we wait let a patient become completely uh, grow and, grow and the growth is stopped, then we do the surgery and then we do the orthodontics. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Understood. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So we don't want okay. to over treat the patient. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now any of the class three patient, how either adult or the young, how they present. So what are the characteristic sign of the class three? They have a short anterior cranial base. The obtuse angle, the angle between uh, here, between the mandible, okay, it's obtuse uh, gunian angle, okay, they have an obtuse gunian angle. Then um, the other patient present as a class three, they have anterior position glenoid fossa. So usually in class two, the glenoid fossa is posteriorly positioned. Therefore, they always have mandible at the back. Now in class three, the patient's Glenoid fossa is usually anteriorly positioned. That is one of the reasons why they present as class three. Then uh, low cranial base flexure. So the flexure, if you see, um, it is very open. The cranial base are open. So the flexure, the, if you make an angle here, okay, at the uh, sala as a middle point and mesion and the gonion, this flexure is low. Okay, there is a sagittal discrepancy. You see the step here, medial step, and there is an increase in the lower facial height. So these are the classic uh, features of class three malocclusion. What are the dental features? We see the class three molars, class three incisors. Okay, the lower incisors are usually retrocline. The upper incisors are procline, and there is a negative overjet. So how we can diagnose it, we can take the history of the patient, okay, and we can understand um, whether it runs in the family or not. Number two is um, if there is no family history, it may be because of COCR discrepancy, okay. We can also examine it, uh, diagnose it by doing the clinical examination, checking whether it's functional or true. And then on radiograph, we do the measurement um, and we see the OPG and self to know which jaw is actual uh, in a problem. So in history, we need to know the age of the patient, the sex of the patient, the family history of the malocclusion. These are the three keys. And in examination, uh, which include the extraoral and in the intraoral examination. In extraoral, you see the profile of the patient. We see a concave profile. We see that the mid face is um, there is an 
deficiency, okay? And then we may find usually class three patients have a, a asymmetrical phase, okay? Whether the midline coincident or not, they mostly they present as facial asymmetry. Then we have to do the TMJ assessment because they may be the class threes because of condylar trauma. Okay, so we have to see for the, they usually are, um, they do grinding of the teeth. So they may have a disc problems and they may have high stress. They have a traumatic occlusion. So the TMJ could be a problem. Uh, uh, they may grind their teeth at night because of traumatic occlusion. So TMJ assessment, any clicks, palpation, uh, pain on palpation should be assessed. So these are the three critical ex extra oral examination that need to be done. And in intra oral examination, of course, uh, we can see class three cases with a lot of cavities, missing teeth, Bolton discrepancy, mesial shift of molars, okay? There is peck shaped lateral incisors, crowding of the teeth. There may be, we can find the functional shift, gingival uh, recession and trauma, could be present, thin gingiva. These are the classic presentation of the class three cases. You also need to evaluate the molar and inside the relationship, overjet and overbite, okay. In radiographic examination, what we actually see, we see the vertical uh, dimension, we see the intermaxillary relationship first, whether it's class one, class two, class three, and the amount of the class three is it. Then we see the vertical relationship, mandibular plane angle, mostly class three present as a high angle cases. If it's low angle class three, it is easy to be treated. If it's high angle class three, it's more difficult to be treated because it's already compensated. Then you have to see the vertical dimension by doing three analysis, um, gonian angle, mandibular plane angle, and the measurement of the length interior, uh, lower facial height, okay? And then one most of the important thing is um, you need to know the compensation of the incisor and the position of the incisors. Are the incisors are upright? Are they retroclined or they are proclined? If the upper incisors are proclined and lower are retroclined, it means it's already compensated. So for you to do the camouflage, it's very difficult. If they are upright or they are not procline or retrocline or they are in normal inclination, then it means you can play with the incisor inclination and do a camouflage treatment. So by doing these radiographic examination, you actually assess the severity of the class three. Okay, so if anybody asks you that whether this class three I can treat and this class I don't treat, the choosing the patient, it depends it's only after doing the cephalometric analysis. By looking at the vertical dimension, by looking the intensity of the sagittal uh, discrepancy, and by looking at the inclination of the incisors, you can decide whether this class three can be treated early or it is very complicated and should not be treated early. So in further, if you go by doing the WITS analysis, you can do the G. GTRV analysis. GTRV analysis is the WITS analysis. They just divide into three groups, the red, green, and yellow. The green is less than uh, minus four millimeter of the A and B uh, of WITS analysis. So less than minus four millimeters means you can do, you can play with the camouflage and inclination and you can treat with early treatment very safely. The yellow is minus four to minus 12 millimeter. It means it could be treated with camouflage. It could not be, okay? And more than 12 millimeter means don't do any orthopedic treatment because the patient is very severe class three and it needs surgical treatment regardless, okay? So what is our summary is early intervention is needed in the children with a moderate to severe anterior cross bite and reverse deep bite as a sagittal and vertical discrepancy of the maxilla, which may contribute towards the class three malocclusion. So actually by unlocking the jaw, you promoting the growth, vertical growth of the maxilla and you correcting the deep bite 
and these two things actually um, help you to make the problem less severe. So class three maybe remain class three, but you can correct the deep bite. You can correct the vertical deficiency of maxilla. So early treatment will help you. Failure of maxilla to grow vertically can result in mandibular overclosure and rotating the mandible upward and forward, producing the appearance of mandibular prognathism, which could be because of the tooth position, uh, because both of the position and size of mandible. So sometimes is mandible is not too large, but keeping the mandible in the protruded position actually promote the growth of the size of the mandible. So early treatment will stop that uh, growth of the mandible, okay? So this GTRV ratio calculated during the early permanent dentition will allow the clinician to perform, to inform the patient whether the malocclusion could be camouflaged by orthodontic or orthopedic treatment or surgical treatment will be required in addition or should be required definitely in the later age. So class three is very difficult to handle, but these patients are very unthankful. I mean, if you start uh, treating the class three, you have to make sure that you inform patient your treatment will be seven years, okay? It is start from the mixed dentition till the permanent dentition. There could be a growth spurt at any age and it could be get worsened and we may need end up in surgery. So now it's your call. Do you want to keep it like this or you want to do some intervention so it can help to make your child look better? So it's give you a psychological benefit and confidence and it may work in your interest and maybe you not end up in any surgery and it would be corrected as it is provided we have keep the retainers and controls in place. Okay, so... Uh, this is a very informed formal consent procedure that we have to do uh, whenever we treat any class three cases, okay? So if I want to summarize the diagnosis of the class three, it can only happen when I have done my history, examination, and radiographic assessment, okay? Then I exactly know which type of the class three is dental or is skeletal class three having a vertical component and the sagittal component in place and what is the contribution of the incisors either they are compensated or non-compensated mm -hmm. so in my summary i have to see the verification of the normal centric occlusion there is cocr discrepancy or not presence of absence of any family uh, history Cephalometric parameters need to be identified, which includes decrease in NS, SNA, negative A and B, mandibular protrusion, obtuse corneal angle, and increase in lower facial height. And then incisor relationship and the inclination. Okay. By putting all this information, I can come up with a class three diagnosis with a skeletal and dental component. And... Um, with the skeletal, we, info, we know that it's a skeletal with a high angle or low angle or normal angle case, okay? So once we know that the patient has a class three malocclusion, what are the treatment options? And the patient come to you in the early age. Early age means uh, late primary dentition or early mixed dentition, then the lower incisors are already erupted, but the upper incisors are partially erupted, is about to erupt. Okay, this is the right age where we can use some of our toolbox and correct the inclination of the jaws, okay? So we could have a couple of appliances, inclined planes. We can have orthopedic appliances, which include the face mask and the chin cup. We can also do the orthodontic camouflage in which we can uh, use mini implants and class three elastics and in last option for class three is the surgical treatment. So the treatment option is start from the early mixed dentition where you can use all three options. Then in the late permanent dentition, we can do the camouflage. And in, in when com on the completion of growth, the only option of class three treatment is the surgery. The studies have showed that 
uh, skeletal framework of class three malocclusion established early before the pubertal growth is spurt. So the conclusion is that treatment should be long-term and in two phases. In phase one, which could be started in the mixed dentition or in late primary dentition, followed by an observation period. And phase two, which is start during or after post-pubertal spot, growth spot. So now let's go in detail of early orthodontic treatment. So in case selection, which we already discussed, approximately 30 to 40% of the class three patients exhibit some degree of the maxillary deficiency. Therefore, devices could be used for maxillary protection for orthodontic treatment in the early mixed dentition. In cases in which the dental component is a primary responsible reason of class three malocclusion, either the dental component or the maxilla, early treatment is recommended. In class three malocclusion originated from the mandibular prognathism, orthodontic treatment in the growing patient is not a good choice. And in most cases, we end up in orthodontic sur orthogenetic surgery and it's recommended after the end of the growth. So the aim of the treatment is of early treatment to correct the obvious problem, to intercept the developing problem, to prevent the problem become getting worse, Okay, we don't want to be uh, maxilla in a trap position and hinder the growth of the vertically maxillary growth and to achieve the specific and limited growth. Okay, and then we keep it on um, follow up and observation. So, what are the indication of general? When it, what are the general indication of early treatment? When we see any crossbite, ankylosed tooth, COCR discrepancy and pseudo class three, excessive protrusion and diastema, okay, open bite, etopic molar and cleft lip and polyp. These are only the indication where we start our treatment early. Because early treatment comes with a lot of limitation. Therefore, all the treatment coming with the problems can't be treated early. Only the crucial problems, which actually help and give us the benefit could be treated early, okay? So what are the limitations at the early treatment? We are incapable of large change in the mandible as compared to the maxilla, because we know that maxillary growth happens in early ages, but the mandibular growth happens only after the post-pubertal uh, response. So targeting mandible, and treating mandible in early age is useless. Yeah, if the problem is because of maxilla or trapped maxilla, treatment of class three would give you the benefit, okay? What else the limitation of early treatment is increase one or two millimeter of the arch length. We can't get more than two millimeter of arch length. So we can correct a minor crowding in class three cases in maxilla. The maturity level, we only get Pubertal is spurred at a certain age. We can't get it early. So we are limited treatment. The size of the mouth could not be changed. If the patient is presented with a large tongue and a big mouth with a class three tendency, you can't restrict the arch arches and you can't have no control on the size of the mouth, okay? Compliance of the patient is also a challenging in the early age. Okay, and the sensitivity threshold, because if you start too early, then patient become very exhausted. And at the right age, we can't do the right treatment. So early treatment should have a proper indication. What are the objective of phase one treatment in class three, having a class three malocclusion? So objective, we have to keep the malocclusion very clean okay, mouth very clean. We have to correct any COCR discrepancy if there is. We have to achieve a stabilized jaw position, whether it's class one or class three, but the jaw position should be stabilized. We have to improve the deformity. So the patient look scarletally class one is straight profile, not a concave profile. We have to correct and control any midline deviations. We have to correct anterior cross spite by establishing the anterior guide, okay? We have to establish by lateral posterior support, which can be achieved 
in the same way by stabilized jaw position. We have to gain space for the buccal teeth. So if there is a crowding, we need to do a little bit of expansion to create some space. And we have to normalize all the oral functions because class three people may come with a couple of habits like jaw popping, cheek thrusting, okay? And tongue thrusting, mouth breathing. So we have to address all these habit issues and make sure that oral functions are normal. So these are all, that's only we have the objective of class three treatment in early age. In phase two, then we have more advanced objective, like the soft tissue needs to be balanced. There should be a functional occlusion. The TMJ and oral functions are good. Oral health and the periodontal status need to be good. There is a correct inclination of the teeth. Okay, so if the patient presented with a mild class three, we can do phase one treatment and then we can do the phase two treatment. And if the patient is come with a severe class three with a prominent mendable is at the fold, then we would not like to do the phase one treatment because it will not give them any um, good results, we should observe such patient and we start the treatment at later stage where we can do a little bit of orthodontic treatment and then we can do the surgical treatment. So what are the benefit of phase one during the post pubertal period, class, skeletal class one, what happened is that when the patient um, is having a spurt, there is a decrease in the occlusal plane angle that compensate for the differential growth of the maxilla and the mandible. Because we know that after the post-pubertal spurt, there is a more mandible growth and less maxilla growth. So the occlusal plane angle changes and maintain the class one. But in the class three patients, there is a more growth of the mandible, but the occlusal plane angle will, it's not change, which leads to the appearance of the class three presentation, okay? So if you start treatment in early adolescence and what you do is you actually changing the occlusal plane angle and doing the same function and the class one can be produced, no doubt there is a more growth of the mandible, but you can control the growth of the mandible with the orthopedic and orthodontic appliances. And you actually working on the occlusal plane angle to give the appearance of class one occlusion. Okay, so the conclusion is that early intervention actually minimize the apical base discrepancy that could be aggregated with the growth. So that's the benefit of phase one treatment and a good retention after phase one treatment, okay? So the success of the class three treatment is depend on the etiology of malocclusion, what is the severity of malocclusion is, the age of the patient, the growth status of the patient, which appliance you choose and the compliance of the patient. So now here is scenario. There are two very common syndromes, cleidocranial dysplasia and Cruzon syndrome. Both present as a class three malocclusion, but you can use face masks. Face masks can only give you the result if you use in the cleidocranial dysplasia, but it will not provide you any result if you use in the patient of Cruzon syndrome. And you know the reason why? Because both syndrome have a different issues. In Cruzon syndrome, there is a synostosis of the sutures, facial sutures. So if you try to even pull the, uh, pull the mid face with the help of the face mask, it will not come out because the sutures are completely synostosed. But while in cleidocranial plasia, if you give the face mask, since the sutures are normal and open, you can see the effect and the benefit of face mask. So in early phase, there are three types of the orthopedic appliance which you can give, the inclined plane, chin cup, and face mask. Inclined plane is not the orthopedic appliance, it's a dental appliance, which can you can give it to the patient and ask the patient to wear it. Um, 
this can help to uh, correct the deep bite, okay? And you can give these inclined pain both in the case of deep bite or the normal bite or low bite or the normal angle. You usually give inclined plane when the lower teeth are well inclined and there is a lingually inclined upper anterior teeth. So these inclined plane will correct the inclination of the upper teeth, help in correction of the cross bite in three to four weeks, produce the proclination of upper teeth, regular inclination of the lower teeth and rotate the mandible downward and backward. It working on the occlusal plane angle, okay? Modified inclined plane, you are indicated in the cases where the lower teeth are labially inclined. It means um, they are protruded. In this case, you put a lower hole retainer with the anterior inclined plane Inclined plane cover inside the third of the lower anterior teeth. The trimming of the acrylic allow the lingual movement of the lower teeth, okay? And this way you can shift from the modified inclined plane to the normal inclined plane. And then after the inclination of lower anterior teeth is fine, it produced the effect on the upper teeth and protrude the upper teeth and uh, increase the occlusal plane angle. Okay, so it's a very basic appliance which you can give it to the patients, okay? It only works on the incisors, inclination, and change the occlusal plane angle. There is no effect on the jaws. Coming to the orthopedic appliance, the chin cup. Chin cup, uh, you can give to the young patient with a mandibular prognathism. Forces are applied on the chin, are oriented along the line from the chin point to the condylar head you need to give around 250 to 300 grams of the force on per side, and you have to ask the patient to wear it at least for 14 hours. Avoid chin cap in pinching the lower inside, uh, lower lips, as this will cause lower incisor to tilt lingually and may produce recession of the lower, lower labial gingival. So you have to watch uh, that if the chin cap should be modified or custom made so that it will not cause any impinging forces on the lower incisors. Therefore, when we buy the chin cup, we check the size of the chin and then we buy the chin cup, okay? Orthopedic effect. What effect you get by giving the chin cup? Redirection of the mandibular growth. It produces backward repositioning of the mandible, retardation of the mandibular growth, remodeling of the mandible and DMJ. It helps in improvement of the profile and reduction in the gonian angle. Chin cups, if effective before the pubertal growth is spurt, a skeletal rebound during the post pubertal growth period, reoccurrence of the cross bite avoided by dental alveolar compensation. It's a tool to correct anterior crossbite in mild to moderate class three patients. It seldom alters the inherited prognathic characteristics. So what chin cup does, it only redirects the growth by making the face. So you have an option, either you like the class three appearance or you like a long face. If the patient says it's better to have a long face than to have a class three phase, then you give a chin cup and it's redirected growth in the vertical dimension instead of a sagittal dimension. But it can't um, stop the growth of the mandible, okay? It's contraindicated in the patient with the apparent mandibular axis and should be worn till there is a completion of the growth. So I have given a chin cup in two of my patients of the class three. They, both kids are around... Uh, they finished their treatment um, in 13 or 14 years. And then I have given as a retainer uh, chin cup just to control till they become 21 years. So they still come to the clinic. And the only purpose of giving them chin cup, actually, I have not given them immediately when they finish the case. But when they come for the retainer checkup, I feel they now getting this spurt and now the mandible is coming forward. Then I added a chin cup and it works very well. They wear only at night. And now we get the same uh, effect. 
uh, class one is maintained and the facial profile is maintained. Okay, so this is a very good tool as a retainer, but as an active treatment, it not do any much benefit. So what you do when you see the patient with a maxilla at fault and coming at the early mixed dentition, you give face mask, okay? The incisors are in crossbite with a mesial step of equivalent to three or more than three millimeter of class three malocclusion, okay? You give the face mask. Face masks apply heavy forces on the mid face in order to advance the maxilla anteriorly. Comprise of the midline rod connected with a chin pad and a forehead. Forces applied through the elastics at the hook, which are placed distal to the canine. They are effective in the primary mixed and early prominent dentition. Optimal time is eruption of maxillary incisors. They help in crossbite correction in three to four months and overbite correction in four to six months. The forces which is needed is around 300 to 600 gram of forces per side for 12 hours. What are the effects of the face mask? It helps in anterior movement of the maxillary dentition. So it increases upper incisor SN angle. They produce lingual inclination of the lower incisors, decrease impa, one to three millimeter of the anterior displacement of whole maxilla, increase in SNA, produce positive overjet, improve the patient profile, produce significant extrusion of the maxillary molars as a side effect, which produce rotation of the mandible in the backward and diver di direction. So it reduced the S SNB, increased the mandibular plane angle and increased lower facial height as a side effect. So Nanda modified the protection headgear face mask in 1980 on some of the biomechanical concepts and he named it as modified protection headgear. What he did, he, he allowed changes in direction of the force and point of the force application of the maxilla as well as chin. So four to eight months of the wear of the headgear will produce one to three millimeter of anterior displacement of the maxilla and one to four millimeter of displacement of maxillary dentition. There is a remodeling at the point B and there is a lingual tipping of lower incisors and downward rotation of the mandible as with any other face mask. What are the component of modified headgear? Protection headgear is the intraoral component which include the removable acrylic plate with the occlusal coverage, or you can use a fixed rapid palatal expander with a high-risk screw. And there is a molar bend with the headgear tubes, okay? The extraoral component is the same face mask, intraoral to extraoral connecting force device. There is a headgear bow and the hook in the premolar region for elastics instead of the canine, okay? So the hook is in the premolar region, which is a different level of the mechanics, produced level of mechanics and results. Magnitude of the force is different based on the age of the patient. If the patient coming in the pre adolescence around five to eight years, you give less force of 200 to 250 grams per side. If the patient coming at the age of eight to 11 years to produce a similar effect, we give an increased force of 300 to 400 gram per side. And if the patient coming very late around 12 years, we give a force of 450 to 600 gram per side. So according to Nanda, the center of resistance of maxilla is five to 10 millimeter below the orbital on the zygomatic bone. But according to 10 is in between the, it's different be, because of different of authors find it differently. So Nanda find it's below the orbital, five to 10 millimeter on zygomatic bone. Tanny find that it's in between the root tips of maxillary first and second premolars. And Nikki found that it's between orbital and distal root tip of first molar. 
So why we need to know the center of resistance in Megzilla? Because our forces should go through the center of resistance, okay? If the line of force is close to the center of resistance, there is a translatory forces. It control the height. It control the opening of the jaw. And usually in high angle cases where we don't want increase in the lower facial height, we have to pass through the, through the center of resistance. So there is no rotation. If line of force is closer to the occlusal plane, then there is a rotational effects, which is more needed in the low angle cases. If line is line of forces is below the level of the occlusal plane, then it rotates the mandible downward and backward. Okay. In class three cases with a long face, you can give vertical chin cup. This help to actually add up effect and reduce, re reduce opening of the bite and increasing in the vertical length. Greater rotation with simple face mask as compared to the modified one. So the bottom line is that why we go with the modified and why we not use the standard one is because in modified, the Nanda passing the direction of the forces through the center of resistance, okay? And putting the hook near the premolars, okay? And by doing all this biomechanic consideration, Nanda is saying that if you use my face mask, the modified one, you will get less rotation effects, less opening of the bite and increase in the high angle. So in pre adolescence, definitely less duration is required, 10 to 12 hours per day. In adolescence, 12 to 16 hours. And uh, it's prescribed for three to 12 months. So Nanda giving different force and different duration of the force uh, placement in different ages to produce the similar effect. Now, these are some of the other appliances. They are not orthopedic appliances, but they are like an inclined plane. They are a couple of appliances. Um, you can put the skeletal anchorage to mini plates in the maxilla in the mandible, and you can use a class three and try to connect the class three mile occlusion. You can even use the functional appliances like Frankel appliance or the bionator, okay? And both of the appliance could work as retainers or it can use as a functional appliance during a growth spurt and correct the class three malocclusion. It's also one of the appliance found in the literature, which could be used to correct the class three, okay? So it's a lot of appliances. The tandem appliance is also a very common one, okay? Um, we should not get lost which appliances, even in myobraces nowadays, class three myobraces have come. The most important thing, appliance is not, you need to know what treatment you are doing, which jaw you are targeting, and then you can choose your appliance based on your needs, okay? End of the day, when the treatment is finished, you finish with the face mask, you finish with a chin cup, you can uh, you can leave the face mask as a retainer. So you have you need some retention, which could be any functional appliance. Okay. So you can do the correction with some orthopedic appliance, get the best result, and then you can keep a functional appliance as a retainer. And the even chin cup you can use as a retainer in early treatment. So retention, you have to keep it two to five years till all the permanent dentition have erupted and then the bite is settled, the growth is finished. And so ideally till the end of the growth, you have to keep the retention. The major relapse you can find in the first six months. So initial uh, retention is the most important. You continued the retention at least two to three years after peak height velocity. So this is another way of measuring it. Completion, after completion of the growth, you can keep the retainers 
or you can keep it for three, five years more, or you can leave it two to three years after peak height, the patient has achieved, okay? So when the, your kid is reach up to the height of the parent, from that date till three years additional, you keep the plants, okay? So for the girls, we keep it till 14 to 15 years, for boys, 16 to 17 years. But in my case, I have showed both for the girls and we finished treatment around 15 years, but still they're having a growth. So I told them till 21 years at night, you keep wearing the headgear, uh, the chinka. And what you can use it for retention, you can use class three binator or Frankel appliance or myobrasis, or you can use the chin cup as your retention appliance.